If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. If you've been following our program over the last few weeks, you'll see that we've been doing a series on the subject of Islam, the, re the Muslim religion. And the title of this series is entitled, Can Believing the Muslim Religion Send Someone to Hell? And we've gone into quite a bit of extensive study and research into the Islamic religion to answer that question. And joining me on this series, this very detailed series, by the way, is my colleague in this ministry, Christian Answers, and the Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here, brother. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Steve did all the uh, tough leg work. I've been after him for years to get this stuff done, and he sure did. <laughs> yeah, that's why we're here doing this video today. So we're answering the question, can believing the Muslim religion send someone to hell? And I think the answer gets very obvious as we go through the material at hand. Now, uh, when we were doing our last show, show number four in this series, we were we left off because of lack of time to finish a certain chart we were discussing. We're going to bring that chart up to begin with as sort of a uh, an example of, uh, of a recap of our previous show, and we're going to move right through into the uh, current topic, which will be Christians' questions on Islam. So we'll try to deal with all that. But right now we're going to go to this chart that you now see on your screen, Old Testament explanations. You'll see there's a list of 11 things there, but in the previous show we already went through the first nine. So if you're really curious about some of those questions and things you're seeing there, you'll have to contact our ministry or ask the cable company to rebroadcast the program. <laughs> we simply don't have time to go through all that again, but we did deal with those first nine questions there. What we're going to do now is ask Steve to pick up with uh, question number 10, and we'll proceed from there. So Steve, uh, let's go after it. All Point right. number 10. Uh, Muslims uh, have tried to look in the Bible and to try to find verses that might be prophesying Muhammad. Since Jesus was prophesying in the Old Testament, they reason perhaps Muhammad was too. One verse that they, some of them think they found is in Psalm 45, 3 through 5. Uh, and, and I'll just read the verse that they talk about, and then we'll talk about the verses around it. It says, uh, Gird your sword upon your side, Almighty One. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand display awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall between your feet. Of course, the verse 6 after that says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Uh, but anyway, uh, Muslims try to say 3 through 5 refers to Muhammad. A couple problems with that. In uh, verse 6, it is talking about God. Now, uh, in verse, um, in the start of it, uh, in verse 2, it says, Most excellent of men. So in 2 through 5, it does seem to uh, refer to a man, and yet in verse 6, it refers to God. Okay, so who would be God and who would be man? Okay, apart from the fact that a few small Islam sects say that Muhammad was like both God and man, Orthodox Muslims do not. But Christians say that Jesus was uh, fully man and fully God. And so this would refer more to Jesus than that. Uh, also in 45 verse 1 it says, My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite verses for my king. Now Jesus is proclaimed as the king. Uh, but Muhammad, to my knowledge, was never proclaimed as a king at all. That's okay, right. so this doesn't refer to Muhammad. And uh, just just looking at it face value, he's talking about a man with a sword and things of this nature. And to just point blank point at Muhammad and say that's talking about Muhammad is stretching it right. by any 
any imagination. I mean, you could claim anybody that had a sword in any battle at any time in history that okay. could be prophesied. It reminds me of those fallacious prophecies of Nostradamus. You know, oh, well, uh, this prophecy was talking about the death of Kennedy, and this one over here, uh, you, you know, Nostradamus would say something like, well, a king will die in battle. Well, lots of kings died in battles. So just because a guy has a sword, you can't say it's Muhammad. Right. Uh, it just There's just not enough evidence there. I and mean, contextually, like you were saying, Muhammad doesn't fit the bill from what we, we what we find what you're saying there. Okay, point 11. All right, another verse that they try to say refers to, uh, uh, to Muhammad is in Isaiah 21, 7, which says, um, When he sees chariots with teams of horses, riders and donkeys, or riders and camels, let him be alert, fully alert. And they claim that riders on donkeys is Jesus, and Jesus was one person, so how it was riders is kind of a problem. Riders on camels, they say, is Muhammad. Again, it's just one person. Uh, and the chariots and the horses, well, they don't really have an answer to that. They just see donkeys and camels, and they say, aha. But anyway, if you look at, at, the, at the context of this, all of um, chapter 21 in Isaiah is a, pro well, verses 1 to 10 at least, are a prophecy against Babylon. And so it's talked about the combined forces, uh, the, or actually the, the Persians and, and, and the Medes under them and other people that, that combined to uh, defeat Babylon, uh, were included horses, donkeys, camels, uh, chariots. Um, and so Muhammad never, you know, himself never defeated ancient Babylon. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure Babylon was even around then. <laughs> um, so. Well, what you're saying here also reminds me of something. We did a paper and we got an audio tape and some pretty good apologetic, Christian apologetic stuff, but it's called Patterns in the Cults. And it just shows how a lot of the cult religions, pseudo-Christian groups, uh, other religions, they have patterns in the way they operate that are similar to each other. And uh, as you're reading these passages that Muslims point to out of the Bible, it reminded me so much of uh, passages, let's say, that uh, uh, Mormons would take of the Old Testament, like mm -hmm. particularly, I think, Ezekiel 37 is one of their favorite, right. the sticks of Joseph. And they try to say, oh, this is talking about the Joseph, prophet Joseph Smith. And I think even the Muslims would, uh, would sit here on this TV show and join us in agreement that uh, those passages in Ezekiel are not talking about this Mormon prophet Joseph Smith Jr. who it's lived like in the 1800s. Right. right. See, they would say, oh, they're, totally, they're trying to put their prophet into a verse and trying to say it's talking about him. And they would agree with us on that. Mm -hmm. But now here's something that's very similar to that. And they try to plant their prophet in there and, and twist and agonize that verse and, and make it a pretext uh, for, for error, basically. Mm -hmm by trying to force something into the context that's not there. Right. Uh, so just using that example, that seems to be a pattern among groups. When they want to get the Bible to agree with them, sometimes they'll find a verse like that and try to force their own man. And in the Muslim's case, it's, it's, it's a Muhammad. In the Mormon's case, it's Joseph Smith Jr. In other groups, they do the same type of thing. Right. So it's interesting when I'm dealing with uh, cultists, uh, they'll agree with us Oh, they can't do that when it's another prophet or somebody they don't believe in. And they'll agree with us that our logic is sound. Uh -huh. But the minute they do the same thing and try to put their prophet in there, then suddenly we're wrong. Yeah. Wait, wait, well, <laughs> the, the other thing I should point out is that when Muslims do try to twist the Bible, this isn't necessarily all Muslims. I, 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 mm -hmm. uh, but it's just some of the Muslims are exactly. doing Exactly. Exactly. To be fair to them. Yeah. I, I, and let it be known, as we stated already at the beginning of this series, so we do not hate the Muslim people. I have friends that are Muslims, and they're very nice people, and and and, and I love them. Uh, we're dealing with theological issue, issues here that have an eternal consequence, mm -hmm. and so it's out of love for the Muslim people that we're doing this series Amen. because that's an important question. The name of this series: Can the Muslim religion send you to hell? And if the answer to that question is yes, if believing the Muslim religion can send you to hell, if the answer is yes, then we as loving people, loving Muslim people would be concerned about that. We don't want Muslims to go to hell. Right. We want to be and so we, heaven. Yeah, we want them to go to heaven. And so therefore, we're going to try to do what we can in a loving ma fashion to convince those people we think are going to heaven not to go there, but go the other way. <laughs> so it's a loving thing we do, not a hateful thing. Mm -hmm. So I want that to be reiterated because I don't think we've done it for a few shows here okay. in the series. Okay, now we've got a new chart here, brother. 
It's New Testament explanations. All right, now we'll talk, now we'll talk about the New Testament. Uh, in John uh, chapter 14, verses 20, 16 to 26, also 15, 26, and 16, 5 through 15, that all talks about the Holy Spirit and Jesus sending another comforter. And um, Muslims would like to say that this other counselor, this paraclete, the one alongside, is actually Muhammad that Jesus will send. The comforter. All right. Well, a couple uh, problems with this. First of all, John 16, 14 says that this comforter glorifies Jesus. So if Muslims want to say that Muhammad glorified Jesus, then they need to glorify Jesus with us also. And I'm not sure they're willing to do that. Uh, so uh, this comforter was sent in Jesus' name. Was Muhammad sent in Jesus' name in John 14, 26? Was Muhammad sent by Jesus in John 16, 7? And, was, uh, and also says this comforter will be in the apostles of Jesus in John 16, 17. Was Muhammad in the apostles? So my uh, view is not only does this not show that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. but I think that most Muslims, if they read these verses carefully and think about it, they will agree that this doesn't show that, that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit. Well, not Spirit. only that, but just the context of the New Testament uh, writings themselves. Yeah. There's innumerable passages that talk about the Holy Spirit, Old Testament and mm -hmm. the New Testament, in much more detail and context. Mm -hmm. In context of the overall flow of Scripture, talking about the Holy Spirit, over and over again, you find the Holy Spirit is God. Right. And He's sovereign. And in 1 Corinthians 12, for instance, the, the Holy Spirit gives to each as He wants, the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, you, you, you know, He sends the apostles in Acts 13. Uh, to here and there to do evangelism work. Uh, the death and, and martyrdom of uh, Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Mm -hmm. uh, he says to these unbelieving Jews, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, how could that be Muhammad he's talking right. about there when he's being stoned to death in Acts 7? Uh, and to me, the death of Stephen has always been something special in my heart. It almost brings a tear to my eye just thinking of, you know, every time I read that passage. But, mm -hmm. but he's talking about you do always resist the Holy Ghost, which is the same thing that act, the Muslims are saying is being spoken of here in uh, John 16, but it's referring to Muhammad. Right. What is, what is Stephen talking about if it's Muhammad? He's mm -hmm. getting stoned to death by his Jews, and he's saying you do always resist Muhammad? No. The Jews weren't stoning him for that. Right. And, and so when you take it all in context, there's no way these passages can mean what the Muslim apologists are saying. Mm -hmm. and, and really, in my opinion, it's a devious uh, trick played on Muslim followers because they already know that most Muslims are not that familiar with the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're just not that familiar. Muslims, by and large, just don't know the Bible that well. And so when a Muslim apologist or teacher can quote a Bible verse, they automatically think, oh, the Muslim teacher is giving them in context what the Bible's talking about, with they themselves not really knowing what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And so they just believe what the Muslim teacher tells them that Bible verse says without really checking into it themselves. And what we're all urging our viewers to do right now is check into it yourselves, and you'll find there's no way that the comforter here mentioned in, in John 14 and so forth can be Muhammad. Just doesn't work when you look at all the scripture verses and in the context of these verses are found themselves. And I think it's just a very important point. I want to jump on this mm -hmm. because it's so key to our, our Muslim friends understanding when, when Muslim instructors are giving you, oh, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. They're playing partially on the fact that they know that you as a Muslim don't know the Bible that well. Why study the Bible when you got the Quran? And so it all looks authoritative until you really get into the, uh, an actual study of the Bible. And that's why we would urge you to study the Bible apart from the Quran, and you will be shocked, no doubt. And that's why the Muslim teachers and instructors want you to stay away from the Bible as much as possible. Anyway, go ahead, brother, with these points. All right. And another one, which is sort of a philosophical uh, issue here, is did Jesus really die on the cross? Okay, well, the Bible is very clear that all of Jesus' followers saw that Jesus died on the cross, and, that, and, and they know that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, Muslims uh, from the very earliest would say Jesus did not die on the cross. And the most common Muslim explanation is, says, well, Jesus was arrested, but God uh, magically almost uh, swapped 
I guess, the souls of Jesus and Judas. So it was sort of like Judas and Jesus' body or Judas swapped with Jesus that looked like Jesus that, that died on the cross. Now this swap fooled not only the Jews and the Romans, but fooled all the apostles and fooled all the Christians. Well, you know, that kind of almost reminds me of one of our previous shows we were discussing, Can Allah Deceive? And he, and he talked about the separation of hypocrites uh -huh. from real believers. And, right. And, and Allah can take another form and things of this nature. And I don't know, that explanation of how they switched and it just appeared and all that kind of stuff, it uh, all looks uh, like it ties in with a deceiving kind of Allah or, or, or things of this nature. But... But the, as we've already established in previous shows, the reliability of the, old, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, based on manuscript evidence, uh, uh, the testimony of the witnesses at the time, mm -hmm. we simply don't find this at all right. in, in, the, so in the Gospel so record. So, so either Allah, if Allah were the same as the God of Christians, uh, wanted his followers to be misled on this for 600 years, or else what people saw was true and the, and, and the Muslims are wrong. And then that would mean Allah is making hypocrites out of all these people and yeah, one on the purpose, <laughs> uh, based on the Islamic teaching. Now, uh, the reason they deny, Muslims deny, uh, that Jesus was crucified is because it's right in the Quran that mm. he was not crucified. Right. And so if, they, if Muslims were to accept that Jesus did indeed die and was crucified, well then they would have to deny Muhammad and the Quran and throw that religion away. It would be uh, just destroyed if, right. if Jesus is crucified and of course naturally it would be because we know in the New Testament the uh, teaches that Jesus was crucified and he shed his blood to forgive us of our sins so we'd be saved from the wrath of God and not go to hell. And it was a part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan. It's all oh, through the Old Testament and the New Testament and and the minute Islam has to admit to that, then that destroys the whole system of the five pillars of Islam. Mm. It destroys the whole system of salvation set up by Islam, proving it to be a false religion right and so anyway that would tie back in because if, if Jesus really did die on the cross then the answer once again will Muslims go to hell uh -huh. would be yes they will go to hell because they're denying the only way of salvation that the New Testament the Bible teaches right to be saved from hell anyway right. go ahead all right uh, in uh, 3 in, in Matthew five seventeen, why don't Christians follow Jewish holidays well, kind of two points in that. First of all, why don't Muslims follow, follow Jewish holidays if they say it's the same religion in, 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 as originally in the Old Testament? You know, because they don't follow any, anything the same. Now, more to the point, though, to ask to answer why Christians don't is because when Jesus came, he superseded the Jewish, sacrifi the Jewish sacrificial system given by God. So we no longer have to follow, make all those sacrifices because Christ sacrificed once and for all. Uh, we don't need to follow Jewish holidays. If you would like to celebrate the Feast of Booths, it's okay. We're, we're living in the spirit, you know, we're not under legalism, but well, we don't need to do that. Uh, and, we, and we don't need to follow the dietary laws. Okay, um, uh, but the moral laws in general, the Old Testament are we do follow, except in some cases Christianity is more strict. In the Old Testament, divorce was permitted because you're hardness of hearts. But Jesus said, you know, I say to you, you know, no divorce, you know, except the possible case of, of, of adultery. Mm -hmm. um, and and the Old Testament said, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But Jesus said, I say to you, you know, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also in uh, four. In Mark 10, 18, and Luke 18, 19, uh, when, when the rich man uh, called Jesus good teacher, and Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Uh, some Muslims and others could point to that and say, well, is Jesus saying here he's not God because he's not good? Not at all. Uh, even in, 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 uh, even in, in the Hadiths, you know, they teach that Jesus was not uh, touched by Satan. But what Jesus is saying is this, Jew, is this Jewish man who did not accept Jesus as the Son of God uh, was calling him a good teacher and throwing that word good around so lightly that Jesus was questioning his assumption says, what do you mean when you say good? You know, because no one is really good but God. And, and Jesus, you know, by his life and ultimate teaching, we can learn that yes, Jesus was good, but don't just call him good because you're just throwing around a flippant word. Call him good because he really is good and he really yeah, is Yeah, and basically that's an admission there that Jesus is God because he's good. And even the, the Islamic teachings say that Jesus is sinless. Mm -hmm. That's about as good as you can get when right. you're sinless. But even Muhammad doesn't fit that bill according to the Islamic teachings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in Luke 5, and apparently Muslims see this as a big issue sometimes, but I don't see any problem here at all. In Luke 3, 23 through 33, uh, it shows that Mary was the center from Judah. 
Okay, well, since Elizabeth was descended from Aaron, according to Luke 1 5, and they were cousins in Luke 1 36, then is that a contradiction in the Bible? Well, remember, people don't have one parent, they have two parents. <laughs> okay, and if, if Mary was descended from Judah on her mother's side, I mean, I'm sorry, if she was descended from Judah on her father's side, okay, Elizabeth and Mary could be cousins. Uh, their cousins could be because their mothers were sisters. It could be that Mary's mother was a sister of, of, of Elizabeth's father. You know, there are lots of ways that they could be cousins and, and, and still be descended because they have two people. And sort of like, it's almost like you're looking more for problems in the Bible than they're looking to answer, to answer those. Okay, the other thing is not really a contradiction, but just kind of a general question of what is a miracle at Pentecost? Okay, Pentecost was a Jewish holiday 50 days after Passover. But the miracle of Pentecost was 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, or, 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 or after the Passover for that, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, that, that was promised as the other comforter came, and, he, and they could see a visible manifestation of flames of fire on the apostles, and they, and they spoke in other tongues. And the Holy Spirit came upon believers at that time. And the Holy Spirit lives inside Christians. We know about God. One reason we know about God is because uh, Jesus dwells in our hearts. And we know about that. And that concept, I don't know if it's as much Muslims disagree with that as they're unfamiliar with that and, and, and hadn't heard that before. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so Christianity is an inward thing that's supposed to express itself outwardly. So, it, so it, it, it's, it's an inward relationship with Jesus Christ that expresses, ourself, that ex expresses itself by we living Christ-like lives. It's not all inward where we just pray and say about God and don't do anything to help the world. And it's not just an outward set of rules either, but it's inward expressing itself as outward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other thing is how are all people sinful from birth? Okay, well, in the Hadith it said people were touched by Satan, and that's a little bit close to the truth. Um, but basically, we all uh, it, uh, we, uh, we all have a sinful nature uh, ever since Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And a sinful nature, uh, one aspect of that is you don't have to teach uh, babies how to be bad. You don't have to teach kids how to be bad. They can do that naturally, but they have to teach. You have to teach and work hard so that they'll be good. Okay, because we just kind of naturally want to be selfish, want to be hateful, and to really live as Christ wants to live, you can't do it naturally. You have to be. You have to do it supernaturally. We need to be born again. So it's not just that we sin because we do sinful actions, but we sin and that we have a sin nature in, inside of us. In fact, the Scripture says in Romans chapter three, verse twenty-three. This is a favorite of Billy Graham concerts, uh, mm. uh, you know, preaching engagements. Uh, Romans 3.23, the Apostle Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then earlier he has this litany of uh, condemnation for people where, I mean, people of all ages and times and anyone born. And basically in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do know there is one. Jesus, he was right. good. Right. He was good. He's the exception. Time. Not yeah. even Muhammad falls into that category, but Jesus does. There's none good but God, Jesus said. Uh, that's why I say that was a, actually an apologetic by him saying he's God, because <laughs> he is good and he's sinless. But anyway, and, and the whole passage just goes on to say how bad people are. Mm -hmm. But the key in, in, in the consummation of the whole passage there is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the Bible, and that's just one little passage. There's, mm -hmm. there's zillions of them. Right. The carnal mind is enmity towards God. Uh, the natural man cannot understand the God, things of God, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. There's all these passages that talk about that. So that answers that question quite well, scripturally speaking. Okay, okay what about point eight, brother? Okay, uh, one thing that uh, Muslims want to understand is how is Jesus the atoning sacrifice uh, for our sins, or for the sins of the whole world in, in uh, 1 John 2, 1, since they had atoning sacrifices in the Old Testament? And there's actually a quite extensive answer to that uh, given in the book of Hebrews. And if you look around chapter 7 to 9, it says that in the, old t the people needed something for their sins. And so they had the continual sacrifices they had to do you know, year after year, all the time, that covered over their sins. But they didn't wash away the sins because they had to keep doing them over and over. But they were a type. Uh, of the uh, a connection you might say with the one permanent atoning sacrifice which was Jesus Christ uh, shedding his blood on the cross 
And since Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross, there is no more need for sacrifice according to Hebrews because Jesus paid it all. And so you have to understand the concept of covering of sin uh, versus actually atoning for sin. Yeah, Jesus is often referred to as the Lamb of God. And, and you look if you have an understanding of Old Testament Jewish tradition and laws, sacrificial system, particularly in the Leviticus and so forth, mm -hmm. you find that Jesus fulfills that in himself. And as you mentioned, Hebrews really gets into that. He's our great high priest, right. and he sacrificed himself for our salvation. And uh, the scriptures are just replete with this. And that's why, in my opinion, as I've st stated before, there. The religion of Islam, the Muslim religion, is a religion of unbelief. If if there really is a devil and the Bible is true, what better religion could the devil come up with with a religion that automatically denies the crucifixion of Christ, mm -hmm. his death on the cross? Because if you end up with that, then you automatically wipe away the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, the whole purpose of his mission here, which was to shed his blood, pay for our sins, atone for to a, a, a holy and righteous God for our sakes and our behalf so we could have uh, redemption and, and, and have fellowship with God restored. But if you come up with a religion that says, oh, Jesus didn't die, he was not crucified, mm -hmm. he, he didn't shed his blood, well, that automatically wipes out everything the Bible's teaching, Old Testament, New Testament. And what better religion of unbelief could you come up with if you're the devil? <laughs> what, a, what a satanic masterpiece mm -hmm. to have a religion that gives lip service to Jesus and the other prophets of the Bible has a veneer that, oh, we believe the Bible, we believe the prophets, we believe Abraham, Noah, and, and so forth, Adam, and Jesus. Oh, blessed prophet Jesus, blessings and peace be upon him. Uh, well, sure we believe him, but then at the same time they undercut everything he actually did, in fact, from the actual scripture. What better religion of unbelief could the devil come up with? Than, and, than, a, than a counterfeit of true belief. Exactly, because he's, he's using all the terms, mm -hmm. making you think, oh, that we agree with him, but then he undercuts. It, it, it's like if you, you, you shoot some animal and I go deer hunting, or if I was with my good friend uh, Dan and he had his bow and arrow. What we have here, uh, my friend Dan has, has shot the deer through the heart. It's, it's a complete deer. It's laying on the ground, and it's all there. But, but then let's say we come up and we cut it open. We take out all the entrails and the heart and the vital organs. And suddenly we have just the hide of the deer. It's not the complete deer. It's the hide of the deer. And all the vital organs and things have been taken out of it. Well, this is sort of what... Islam does to Christianity. If 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 let's say we have a, a gospel deer <laughs> running along and here's Muhammad with his bow and arrow and he shoots it right through the heart and it drops to the ground and he comes up with his sword, hacks it open, and he rips out all the vital organs of the gospel message and of the Old Testament prophets. And he holds up this hide that's just a it's not what it was before. It's now dead, for one thing. Yeah. And all its guts and everything have been ripped out of it. And he's holding it up and saying, this is the gospel deer of the, of the people of the book, uh, the Old Testament prophets of the Jews and, and the New Testament of the Christians. This is what it, this is, what it is and what it, what it now is and always was. Well, that's not true. He already cut the guts out of it and changed it up. Yeah, that's just a dead hide he's holding up there. That's not a living gospel deer running through the forest. Uh, yeah. So that's why I would say you can't come up with a better counterfeit religion or a gospel of unbelief than a religion like Islam, which gives all a lip service to Christianity, gives a lip service to Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, and all those guys, but then cuts their message out from under, takes out the vital organs, and then presents to us just a. a a dead hide mm -hmm. and says well this is what it's like and now believe me well it just doesn't work and it also uh, answers the question then that we've been trying to answer in the series uh, and we'll keep answering it over and over again can the Muslim religion send someone to hell well of course it can send you to hell if you're changing the message up and you're cutting the vital organs out and mm -hmm. giving us something that's dead in replace of a living gospel message 
Well, it can't do anything but send you to hell. Yeah, yeah. Your analogy is also appropriate, unfortunately, because right now, since the fall of communism, at least, the number one persecutor of Christians is the Muslim religion. And it's like, well, if they can't get Christians to defect or whatever, they kill them. If you look especially in Indonesia, you look in Sudan, uh, you look in some other places in, in, uh, in, in, in Central Asia, um, you know, it's like, well, if we worship the same God, then why are they killing all, the, all, all of the Christians? Because it becomes patently obvious when you really study and compare the two religions, they're just alien religions to mm -hmm. each other. They are totally different, and they're saying totally different things. Right. Although Islam gives lip service to the Bible, it actually, in fact, changes everything up mm. and uh, comes up with a totally alien religion that has really nothing to do with Christianity other than he uses some of the same words. And we already know Christianity was here first. Right. And so he is coming up with something different and changing it hundreds of years later with the ev historical evidence all in place to reflect to refute his assertions. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with that said, uh, you already covered point eight on the chart. Mm -hmm. So let's go to this final chart and move on to our other subject. Okay. The resolution I think is worth repeating uh, for our viewers. You've got the uh, visit uh, answeringislam.org UK. Uh, could you just tell our viewers yeah. who are looking at this right now? Yeah, uh, uh, www.answeringislam.org.uk is an excellent website. It's not done by us, done by somebody else. Uh, but it has a lot of uh, things that show the problems with the Quran and with Islam, as well as Muslim responses, so you can kind of see both sides. Uh, uh, another website that, that, that we've done is www.inerrancy.org, and that's I-N-E-R-R-A-N-C-Y.org, uh, has answers to over 7,000 questions about the Bible. And those are questions for the skeptics, uh, ath uh, atheists, uh, cri genuine Christians, uh, cultists, uh, Muslims, Hindus, all kinds of people might have about the Bible. So it's not primarily a, 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 a website for Muslims, but if Muslims do have questions about the Bible or their interpretation of verses, then there are a lot of answers there. If they say there are difficulties in the Bible, they'll probably find the answers to those difficulties there. Very good. And of course, as you can see, we also have at the Bible stands in Islam Paul's Consider the words of the prophet Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No, by, no man comes to the Father except by me. That part's not mentioned here on the chart, but that's mm -hmm. part of the verse. John 14, 6. You must make a decision about Jesus. Is Muhammad telling you the truth about Jesus? Mm -hmm. Or is Jesus telling you the truth about right. Jesus? Because after all, Jesus was here first. The, the historical documentation is there. I would go with... The, it's sort of like these guys that listen to music and you know how you have an original artist he comes out with a hit song and uh, people always seem to like that hit song by the original artist hmm. but let's say you get some guy years later that nobody knows and he does a remake of hmm. that original hit song it's just not quite the same people right. want the original well we've got the original in Jesus and we've got the original CDs, LPs, <laughs> 45s, and 78 records. I mean, we got we got it all. Yeah. And we don't need somebody coming along years later and trying to do a remake when we already got all the originals. That sounds different. So anyway, just something to think about for our viewers out there. But now uh, let's move right into this next chart, which uh, lists Christians' questions on Islam. And this is kind of uh, giving you an outline of things that uh, we're, we'll be covering here. What is Islam? The Quran? Why are there different sects of Islam? Other writings about Muhammad? Muhammad and Jesus? Experience and practice? How close is Islam to the Bible? Let's go right to this first chart as time okay. flies. Islam. And Steve just take it away there. That's our chart. Okay. Well, it just let you know that the number one question that Christians ask me about Islam is kind of surprising. It, but it's this. It's basically, is the Muslim religion and Islam the same thing? That's the number one question that I'm asked. And it just kind of shows a uh, lack of understanding of, of what, what Islam is. And it's kind of amazing if the fifth of the world, uh, almost the fifth of the world, is, is Muslim. And it's like Christians need to, I guess, be more aware of what's going on around them, especially when, when the Muslims are responsible for, for persecuting Christians in many parts of the world, and to really understand something about that and, and who they might be sharing with. Okay, um, the, uh, Islam uh, typically has f uh, described as five pillars of Islam. There's a sixth one that some people say that I'll also tell you about. But first of all, there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. The second one is they believe 
and fasting, which was originally on the same day as the pagan Meccans, but then was changed. They believe in giving alms, at least to other Muslims. Uh, it's unclear, because they haven't seen them in the Hadith, in the Hadith or anywhere, that they would ever give alms to idolaters, or they'd ever give alms to Jews or Christians, uh, at least according to their religion. Now, they pray toward Mecca. Uh, five times a day, just like the pagans did. They had pilgrimages called Umrah to Mecca, as the pagan Meccans did. Then there's what some people call the sixth pillar of Islam, which is Jihad, or Holy War, uh, but other Muslims would not call that a pillar of Islam. Uh, and then other things that they that think about, you have to understand the Quran, the Islamic State and Islamic law, what all that means uh, to women and to everybody, the Jihad and human rights, uh, the Muslim view of Jesus in the Bible, uh, how they view Christians and Jews, and also kind of this uh, Mandeans uh, versus other religions, uh, about the mosques and the diet and Mecca and ritual washings and, of course, the role of women. These yeah. are the kinds of things to understand. Nobody is uh, Just uh, briefly uh, mention uh, the distinct difference between Muslims and Christians on Jesus. Because we, okay. we, we mentioned how we ripped out, you know, they, they rip out the vital organs that Jesus was not crucified, but they also uh, annihilate what the Bible says about the very nature of Jesus. So what's the difference for our viewers' sake uh, right. between the two? Uh, Muslims uh, revere Jesus as a prophet. They say he was no more than a prophet, and apparently he was one prophet who was given a message for all mankind that Allah allowed to be totally corrupted. He was just a sinless man, according to Islamic teachings, that was a, a prophet for sin, yeah. Allah. Mm -hmm. But he was just a man. He was a created being. Uh, special man, though. They, they accept that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Right. He, so he's a special man without sin, born of a virgin, yeah. and he's just a really good guy. Right. But that's all he is. He's a man, a special man. He's not right. God or right. anything like that. All right. And, and, of course, Christians say that Jesus was fully human, and he was just like us, except without sin. In addition, Jesus was fully God. Uh, he, he, is, he is God the Son. And, and he came and he died on the cross for our sins and rose again, you know, bodily resurrection from the dead. And so we obviously have a very different view about who Jesus well, is. Well, that's about as different as you can get because like in Islam, Jesus. yeah, the Jesus of Islam is simply a really good guy. He's a mm -hmm. man. But in Christianity, Jesus is not only a man, but he's God in the flesh, right. as John 1.1 1, 1 and John 14 says, John 1.14. Yeah. And, and, and you have all kinds of people, not just Muslims, but other people say, well, God couldn't, cannot come in the flesh. It's like, well, who are you to tell God Almighty what he cannot do? Now, God may choose to do something or not to do something, but don't be so foolish as to say God Almighty cannot do something. Now, let me ask you this logical question. It's just pure logic, and you, you should be able to answer it. You're the one with the PhD, after all, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to me, it's always made perfectly good sense. But now, uh, in the hypothetical, if Jesus is who he says he is, and mm -hmm. he says he is the I am, he's God, uh, he accepted worship from Thomas, who said, my Lord and my God, in John right. 20, 28. Uh, if Jesus, and this is for the sake of the viewers, remember, I'm asking a hypothetical, logical question. If Jesus is God, and you, but, but at, at that same time, you as a Muslim deny that and say, no, he's just a good prophet, he's a good man. Mm -hmm. But we're taking a hypothetical now for the sake of the Muslim viewers. If he is God, but you as a Muslim say, no, that's not true, that can't be true, he's just a good man. Mm -hmm. Does that Muslim believe in God? Not the same God. So he can't be believing. The hypothetical is if Jesus is God, Mm -hmm. He is the creator of the world. He is the living and true God. A Muslim who would deny that then would have to necessarily not believe in the true and living God. Right. Now, my answer as a Christian is that they would not believe in the same God. Now, Muslims, though, uh, and, and it actually says, shows in the Quran that they believe they do worship the same God, except they say that Christians associate partners with God while Muslims don't. And so Muslims... Uh, and some Sunni Muslims in Malaysia are an exception to this. Uh, but Muslims in general claim they worship the same God as Christians. But if you look at it, if Jesus is God and they exactly. say not God, then they don't. See, it's, it's impossible for them to make the argument they worship the same God because if Jesus is God, as the Christians claim, mm -hmm. and the Bible clearly states Old Testament, New Testament, 
That's why they deny. <laughs> That's why it's a religion of unbelief because they deny what the Bible says. Yeah. But the Bible says He is God. Well, then they can't be believing in the true and living God because they don't believe Jesus is God. Right. And that makes them idolaters. Mm -hmm. And even God. in Islam, an idolater is someone who's going to hell. Mm -hmm. So. If that that's one reason why Muslims have to deny and not believe what the Bible says. Yeah, and and on one hand, Christians say that Jesus is is God the Son, and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But make sure you understand that G Christians are not saying that Jesus dying on our sins is is just an optional thing, or that or that it's optional to believe in His shed blood on the cross. It's like there's no other way to go to heaven except through Jesus. It's not optional at all. Yeah, there's no options at all in this situation. I mean, you know, uh, in the Quran, they abrogate verses out of there, like you've mentioned before, the satanic verses and things, but mm -hmm. there's no abrogation of verses out of the Bible that you find. Uh, there's no Islamic teachings along that line where you can just take out what you don't want to see. Now, Muhammad may come come along 600 years later and want to abrogate a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah now, But it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, now I would say, uh, qualify that by saying Jesus did supersede certain things, but it's not taking it out. It's saying go on top of it. Like the sacrifices were all valid. And in a sense, Christians sacrifice today, but they sacrifice because of, of connecting through Jesus who sacrificed once for us. And so that's why we do not do sacrifices right. anymore. Well, with that said, let's uh, let's move on then to the next uh, chart here we see, the viewers at home see, the Quran. Okay, so to kind of give Christians a, a very, very quick o overview of the Quran, the Quran I've heard is roughly about the size of the Christian New Testament. Uh, and it is not quite the same as the original. There are uh, some surahs that, that there are some question as to whether they're in or not, uh, three surahs. Uh, and there's a, another surah, a very short one, that might have been in, in there originally and is not now. And there are a few differences. Are there inaccuracies in the Quran? Yes, there are internal inconsistencies and contradictions. They're all external things. The sun doesn't go down in, in, in a muddy spring, for example. Uh, and there are contradictions in, in the Quran. And how do Muslims think the Quran was inspired? Okay, this is kind of an unspoken thing where Muslims and Christians often think that the other thinks their books were inspired in the same way, when actually that's not true. Uh, many Muslims, not all, but many Muslims believe in sort of what would be called a mechanical dictation theory, and that the Quran on earth is a perfect copy of the Quran in heaven, word for word, syllable for syllable. Okay, and so if it has changed, and if it's not, or if something was abrogated, then something's wrong there. Okay, Christians, as a general rule, uh, and uh, they believe that the meaning of the Bible is what's important, and that the meaning of the Bible has been preserved. And yes, there have been some copyist errors, and, and uh, but the message and 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 the meaning that's given and the facts given are all there. Um, but don't get too hung up about the genealogies. Paul said, don't get too hung up about, about the individual words. It's the meaning that's important. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say on this particular chart? Or? Uh, no. Okay, then we'll move on to the next one. Different sects of Islam. All right. Uh, you probably, can, if you look at like Roman Catholics and Orthodox and Protestants and even throw in a few cults, you really can't stereotype them and say they all believe the same thing. Okay, well, it's not accurate for a Christian to stereotype Muslims and say they all believe the same thing either. Uh, there are Sunni sects. Uh, such as the Shafi'i, the Hanafi, the Hanbali, and the Maliki uh, that are maybe fairly close and they accept the uh, four collections of Hadith as authoritative along with the Quran, with the Quran being higher. Uh, the Malay, uh, but they all, all sects of Muslim pretty much agree that they worship the same God as the Christians and Jews. Uh, with the Malaysian Sunni, they've actually passed a law saying that any Christian literature that would say that uh, the Christians worship Allah is banned because they do not accept that. Uh, they have the Wahhabis, which is uh, more of a uh, looking at the Quran and uh, dispensing with the different traditions. Uh, then among the Shiites, you have the, what's called the, in roughly the Seveners and the Twelvers, depending upon their views of the succession and the number of Imams that they're going to be. Then you have Sufi sects, and uh, Sufi, you know, if many people think of Islam as sort of a dry Pharisee kind of tradition bound, just external rules and stuff. Sufis were almost a reaction to that. Uh, they emphasize a lot the inward uh, feelings, devotions. Uh, Sufis are not known for persecuting other people. Uh, there are different sects of Sufis. Some of them actually smoked hashish. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and they're um, very much for, I guess, the, the, the inward part, and sort of like the outward part doesn't matter as, you know, so much. 
all the rest. And then there's what's called the Gulat, which is sort of like a Muslim cult sex, and at least they're considered that. They're Alawites, uh, who kind of broke off from, from uh, the Shiites, and they have some unusual beliefs. Um, the Alawites have, are a major uh, political force in the country of Syria, actually, and many of them believe it's okay to drink alcohol. Uh, then, uh, then you have the Ahmadiyya, uh, who uh, believe that Jesus actually lived and he traveled to basically um, the, the um, Kashmir uh, up in northern India, and in that general area he lived and married and died and everything, and they're kind of unusual. And there's the Aga Khani uh, Muslims, and the Ahmadiyya and Aga Khani are actually persecuted today uh, in Pakistan where they're strong there. There are a couple of groups that the Sikhs are actually sort of somebody trying to combine Hinduism and Islam, which you say, well, that'd be a kind of a strange combination. And it's like, well, it's pretty hard to say that they go together, but the Sikhs <laughs> attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Baha'is, which are attempt to unite all world religions, uh, had a Baha'i tell me they got started in Iran because Iran was the most backward country at, the, at that time. Uh, the Baha'is, <coughs> they don't persecute other people, uh, but they were uh, had many prominent positions under the Shah of Iran. And once Khomeini came to power, many Baha'is were killed or exiled. And, and the Baha'is actually have two groups that are kind of very much opposed to each other. You know what I think is funny is uh, for our ministry, uh, we actually got a letter from uh, their world headquarters mm. in uh, Haifa, Israel. They even put the letter in uh, one of our Christian Answers newsletters. But uh, they were ordering our material for their, uh, let's see, what do they call it here? The uh, Department of Library and Archival Services. Okay. They ordered our material on Baha'ism. See what we were up to. Oh. But, uh, okay. Anyway, I just threw that in because yeah. I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess they study our material. I mean, we study Muslim material. At least they're about everything. At least they're attempting to get there. A lot of people don't even listen or research anything. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. Okay. And then the Druze, which is a very small kind of unusual uh, religion in its own right, uh, they believe that a guy named Lord Hakim. Uh, was visible God, and and I would say the Jews are not Muslims, but they kind of have Muslim origin or Muslim roots. Then you have black Muslims, which are often uh, thought of as heretics by Orthodox Muslims, and actually kind of for good reason. Uh, you know, uh, generally white people are not allowed in uh, you know in, in black Muslim religious services, and they're very very racist. Uh, while in Islam, you know, they do accept people from from every race. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, how about this next one? Well, it, it's kind of, kind of interesting just to kind of see through history how many people have claimed to be uh, the Mahdi, which is like the, the, an Imam in Shiite Muslim who disappeared and they say will return in the end times. Uh, you might say some analogous to, you know, you have some kind of doomsday cults and, and, you, and you have some weird things in Christianity with people like Reverend Moon saying that Christ returned. Well, you have people in Islam saying they're the Mahdi or they're somebody else. And the Baha'u'llah in the Baha'is, you know, he claims he's kind of a combination of the Mahdi and Islam, Christ returned, uh, you, know, and, uh, you know, within Hinduism and, and, and everything else. There was another guy who was uh, very colorful to say the least named Sliman Murshad of Syria. Uh, he was finally executed in 1949. But uh, among the Alamite, Alawite Muslims, some but not all thought he was a messiah. And he would do things like um, put phosphorus over his body and phosphorus glows, and then he would have little lights and like a hidden battery. So he's sort of like a messiah, but a battery powered. Uh, and he would do, he would like hide food behind walls, and he'd make a hole in the wall and bring food out for the people, and he'd do kind of fake miracles that way. Uh, okay, and he got a lot of believers that way through his uh, chicanery. For a while until the French kind of got tired of him. <laughs> and then there was the. the, he, the didn't, he, he didn't have any way to uh, stave off the bullets of the firing squad. Huh? No, no. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure how he died, actually. But, right. but in the modest movement in, in, in Sudan, which uh, fought the British, then uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad in 1879, who was sort of the founder, you know, kind of the Messiah or Christ Return mm -hmm. or whatever, the Ahmadiyya movement. And then uh, Ali bin Abi Talib and Solomon al Farisi, okay, they themselves, uh, we have no evidence that they claim to be God, but some Alawite sects worship them as sort of a Muslim tritheism. Mm -hmm. And we already talked about the Jews with Lord ha Hakim. So a lot of people within Islam have a lot of strange teachings. In fact, in Islam, there's this one very small sect. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's kind of like Kazilatash. They actually believe in a strange form of reincarnation, mm -hmm. which you don't find in anywhere else in Islam. So, you know, just like you find a lot of strange little groups in India, you find some strange groups in America, you have some strange groups in the Middle yeah. East, too. Mm -hmm. 
just like the strange Unification Church of Reverend Moon, for right. instance. But anyway, uh, other writings about Muhammad. Okay, well, there are lots of things claimed to be about Muhammad. Although there are over a couple hundred thousand hadiths claimed to be by him, and, and some of them are kind of um, strange and almost, you know, very unusual. And Muslims, as a, as a rule, do not accept all these as genuine, and I think rightfully so, actually. Uh, they're the Hadith collections in which they've tried to filter among these what they thought were. And I have the four collections behind me. Um, the uh, Abu Qar Hadith, the Sahih Muslim, the Fiqh as Sunnah, and the Riyadat as Salahin. Um, so, and, and that's mainly for the Sunni Muslims. And the Shiite Muslims, they tend to follow what the Imams say, especially I believe it's the sixth Imam and, and various other Imams. All right. Okay, uh, what about, now we already went into this some detail a while ago, so we we'll just stick to the chart here. Uh, Muhammad and Jesus. Okay. Well, Jesus is called the Christ or Messiah in the Quran uh, in uh, Surah 575, 517, actually two times there, uh, Surah 345, Surah 4157, along with verses 171 and 172 in Surah 930. So the Quran itself recognizes Jesus as a Messiah. Now, it doesn't say Jesus is the Son of God, and they may have a different meaning of what the Messiah is versus uh, Christians, but it does recognize that he is the Messiah. Right, but they use the same terminology Christians will use, but then change the meaning of that right. to something totally different. Right. Like we said before, it's a big difference between being a man and being God. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's almost an infinite difference. Okay, back to the chart. Okay. Well, G the Quran says that Jesus was given the angel, uh, and angel there meaning the gospel. Uh, and, and also Jesus confirmed the Torah and so Jesus accepted as true the Torah which means Jesus had the Torah and since we have the Dead Sea Scrolls from the time of Jesus we know what the Bible looked like which is very similar to what the Old Testament is today right. and we know what Jesus which, did. Which destroys uh, Muslims arguments that the Bible's all corrupted and right. messed up and changed and so it just doesn't work from factual evidence. Right. Okay, do Muslims pay attention to Jesus or not? Uh, they, they, uh, they claim to. They say, peace be upon him, and, and, and they say he is a prophet, but they reject his words. Right, so it just doesn't, doesn't work like we were talking about before. Etiquette with Sunni all right, Muslims. All right, th these are some smaller points that if you live with Muslims or have Muslims as friends, here are some things you might consider to have more harmonious relations with them. Uh, don't give, for at least a Sunni Muslim, a dog. Uh, uh, Muslims, they might use dogs you know, in hunting, but they would not think of a dog as, they think of dogs as unclean. They wouldn't necessarily think of them as a house pet. Uh, don't give them statues because all, almost all Muslim art does not have pictures of people or animals because they feel, that, well, that could be, somebody might be induced to worship that. So yeah, a so form of idolatry. Yeah, 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 the only exception is that some Turkish uh, Muslim art does have people, but most Muslim art does not. Uh, then uh, uh, in the Hadiths that talk about don't have wigs, don't have gold or silver rings, uh, don't wear silk clothes for men, though they could wear velvet, uh, don't give them pork or donkey meat to eat, uh, don't give them meat of beasts with fangs, uh, don't give them garlic, and they shouldn't have tattoos, which actually the Old Testament says don't have tattoos either. And also, curious enough, don't have braces for teeth. And there are a bunch of uh, hadiths uh, in Bukhari volume 7 um, that go through all these things. And then from Sahih Muslim, it indicates they don't believe in contraceptives, birth control pills. Uh, Muslims are fairly unanimous in being pro-life and against abortion. Um, it kind of says, curiously enough, in volume 4, uh, 12, page 1222, that they should not have for a chest, for a chessboard, they shouldn't have a gecko or, or a house lizard, according to Sahih Muslim. Now you're telling me, you're telling me they, they can't have a chessboard? Yeah, I know, that, that you no, would like I, that. <laughs> I, I know, I'm a big chess player. I love yeah. chess. Wait, wait, wait. And, and what's funny is, uh, at my work, there was a the devout Muslim who was reading his Quran all the time and stuff, but he would be playing chess with us on some of his breaks. He would take time from reading his Quran and join us in, uh, in playing chess, and uh, part of it was he believed that uh, chess was invented by a, a uh, Arab uh, sheikh uh -huh. uh, to teach his military leaders how to think along strategy and logical lines. Huh. And uh, so he started playing chess with us, even though he, and he wore all a Muslim garb and had his Quran right there. Do you know? But you're he, telling me that he probably did. He probably wasn't aware of this hadith. Well, do you know if he was Sunni or Shiite or something? I sure don't. I never asked him. Uh, that. I, I, all right. If if he was Shiite, there's no problem at all because they wouldn't necessarily accept this. Uh, mm -hmm. it, if he was Sunni, then maybe he wasn't aware of this hadith or, or he something. He probably like that. wasn't, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, brother, 
uh, we'll get back to more important things here, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm uh, quite sure in his case uh, he was probably not aware of it. He seemed to be pretty devout. And I, usually when I talk to him, I would witness Christ to him, but like I said, Islam is a, a, a religion of unbelief. Mm -hmm. He was just sure the Quran was true in the Bible, and anything I had to say about Christ was not true. Yeah. And so usually... Uh, although I wish it would work out that way, uh, you know, whoever wins a chess game was right, and I always won, and, but that still didn't convince him. No, he, 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 he was by a, a, a force of man, even in his chess yeah, game. Unfortunately, <laughs> that, that, that worked out the way. Well, we're almost out of time in this segment of the program. Uh, we have a lot more material, but we'll just pick up on it in our next programs as, as, as we continue in this series. Uh, but uh, with time running out, kind of briefly, uh, uh, Give us a few more comments, if you like, on uh, what we've discussed so far for Christians. Okay. Because this is mainly Christians' questions about Islam. What would you tell Christian witnesses what? in how to deal with Muslims? Well, well, first of all, Christians need to know how close is Islam to Christianity. Is it possible for somebody to accept uh, Muhammad and believe all of Israel, I Islam and be a believer and go to heaven? And the answer basically is Islam is contrary to the Bible. It says that the blood of Jesus uh, does not save you from your sins. It's a bad thing to believe Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God and they reject uh, Jesus at, at, as the Son of God and they need the gospel and you need to share with them so that they can go to heaven. And it can be done. It can be done because once I was at the uh, University of Texas I, I spent a lot of time witnessing at UT and when I was there one time, I was run, helping run a, uh, a Christian book table uh, while I had a speaker up front, and a bunch of Muslim students from Algeria came up, and they were asking me questions about the Bible and things of this nature. But they were like so many Muslims and so many Christians. They were nominal. Mm -hmm. They were nominal Muslims. In other words, they were they were they were come from a Muslim country, Algeria, but they didn't know that much about the Quran, didn't spend time reading. They're more secularized, much like Christians are in this country. Many you got lot, they give lip service to the Bible, but they really don't know what the Bible says. And if they show up at Christmas and Easter, they're doing good for them yeah. anyway. But anyway, so I was able to use that opportunity. I said, well, I would love to come over and talk to you about the Bible. And uh, they gave me a time, gave me their address. And I spent six hours on a Sunday afternoon uh, talking with these just wonderful Islamic students or nominal Islamic mm -hmm. students and we had a great time as I got into the Bible showing them passages and verses that would contradict what the Quran said in fact it was almost kind of bad I almost knew more about the Quran than they did uh -huh. but it was a great witnessing opportunity and so and we had a good time I was I, would, I could have stayed longer but six hours was a max <laughs> uh, so just to let you know Christians out there you can dialogue with Muslims but know your Bible so you'll be able to share something if you don't know the Bible, you need to learn the Bible first. Right, you need to read all of it. Well, anyway, we're out of time for this segment. Uh, just want to let our viewers know that we do have some free newsletters. Our Christian Answers newsletters are available. We have a free news uh, uh, a resource list. We have uh, plenty of tracts and literature on uh, like the Hadith, the Quran, and so forth. You can contact our major phone numbers and address are at the end of the screen. Uh, give us a call, right, and we'll send you stuff free. Just leave your mailing address if you're calling on the phone, and uh, we'll get this stuff to you. But I'm Larry Wessels uh, for Christian Answers with uh, Steve Morrison, my colleague at Christian Answers, our director of research. Thank you for being with us. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and what does the Bible say? Acts 16:31. How must I be, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not Muhammad, but Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us. Join us again next time in this series on Islam. God bless you all. What is Jesus' gospel which he entrusted to his apostles? The answer can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 8, which states, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, as of first importance, that I also receive, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he, he appeared to me also. 
All of this is attested to by Jesus' own disciples, eyewitnesses, and apostles, along with manuscript and early church history. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 